Okay, so this is being recorded. Um, welcome to the Python Trainer Summit 2021. This um, was first launched last year. Um, it has only ever been uh, um, virtual because it started last year. And so this is um, focused to try and give the educators, people who both identify as educators, but pe also people who recognize that education is part of their work, but not necessarily professionally as an educator, um, to really talk about teaching in the more industry areas, so either the professional development training or um, how companies and corporations are actually doing training and stuff like that. And so uh, it was really awesome last year. It's going to be awesome again this year. We have a full schedule going on. And so Let's do our quick code of conduct remarks, and then we're going to just jump right into talks. Um, so code of conduct reminder, we want everyone attendee to feel welcome and have an enjoyable experience here at PyCon, even if it's a virtual event. Uh, so please familiarize yourself if you have not already with PyCon's code of conduct and attendee procedure for reporting code of conduct incidents. There's a variety of links in there. You can also find them on the main Python con PyCon uh, conference website. If you have any concerns, there's procedures for reporting an incident there. You're also very welcome to DM me here in Zoom if you have any questions or if you have any concerns or you want help reporting something. I can usually take care of stuff. I've been on code of conduct committees before. I have handled code of conduct um, issues within Zoom workshops before. So nothing strange to me. You won't you, it, no emails shock me basically at this point. I have seen just about everything there is to see. Um, both experienced and then also dealt with it as an instructor. So it does say tutorial, but we're here at a summit. It is going to be recorded, it is being recorded right now, um, and will be posted publicly on YouTube later on. So if you do not wish to have your vi voice or video as part of the recording, please turn both, keep yourself muted and keep your video off so it will not be included. Um, and the chat itself is not being recorded, um, but it is sort of, public enough that other people see it. So um, my usual way of summing up co-conducts are um, use welcoming language, be nice to each other and don't touch each other. And as I said yesterday, the touching, not a huge issue currently, um, but that doesn't discount that you still have to be nice and use welcoming language. So we're all professionals here and we can take care of business pretty well. So with that said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about logistics for this afternoon for the next two hours. So for today's format, please stay muted. Um, hey, Trey, thanks for joining. Um, please stay muted during the um, during the talks um, to, save, to um, allow our speakers to focus on stuff. Um, if, it, if a speaker invites you to take the microphone, you're very welcome to, you have permissions to, but please stay muted. I will be actively monitoring um, the audio. And so if anyone needs to be muted, uh, I will take care of that for you. Um, but you know, by default, everyone should be muted coming in. Speakers, of course, are invited to turn on their cameras when they're speaking, but for the purposes of bandwidth, um, for the recording and for people who are um, paying a lot of money to have <laughs> internet access or maybe working with um, a difficult connection, I would ask everyone who's not speaking to please go ahead and turn off your video just to save that bandwidth in there. Um, and so during the talk, so protocols during the talk, um, we're gonna be keep questions that you have within the chat. So go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, all you can go ahead and start a queue of questions um, toward as the speaker is finishing up. Go ahead and place your questions in the chat. When I see those questions, um, I will read them out at the end or when they're done talking. So please in the chat, do not, you of course, like if the speaker asks a question and wants to hear from you all, please answer the question in chat. But please, as much as you can, avoid like lengthy threads happening in the chat because I'm trying to monitor the chat, the speaker's trying to monitor the chat, and it's really hard to do that because Zoom chat is not the greatest invention in the world. So um, please be mindful of that. Uh, I might, if, if something like that happens, I might give you a little ping to, to um, save that for later. Okay, so when the speaker is done, so each speaker has 15 minutes, except for the lightning talk, so it's a little bit faster, but each main talk is gonna have 15 minutes plus about five minutes for questions. Um, for the purposes of the recording, I will read the question out um, to the speaker. So speakers, please wait until I finish reading the question. Um, 
and then they'll answer the question. And so you're welcome to do follow up answers, etc. in the chat. Um, when you are asking a question, please keep your question in the form of a question, um, not uh, giving, well, have you seen this? Or did you think of doing that? Unless they specifically say, I wasn't sure how to do this thing. I'm welcome. I'm open to suggestions for how to do it. If they didn't explicitly ask for suggestions, please be editorial in how you provide suggestions and don't just tell people things. Okay. Um, most speakers are going to provide contact information. So if you want to tell them about something super awesome, um, please do that via email or something else. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our first talk, who is going to be the keynote here with Cher um, from the Carpentries. I'll let you introduce yourself, Cher. Um, just a reminder, please go ahead and turn your videos off while Cher speaking so we can save the bandwidth. And um, I may turn that off if I see anyone jumping in there. So, all right, you ready? I am. You ready? All right, I, I'll start a timer and I'll give you a couple minutes notice. All right. Hey, 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 everyone. I am Cher. I am from the Carpentries, where I'm the deputy director of workshops and meetings. And I come to you by way of Detroit, Michigan. And so I'm going to share my slides. And so today I want to talk to you about virtual teaching, the new way of life. And I'll tell you, within the Carpentries, I was not a proponent of this initially, and I'll explain a little bit more why. So before I get started, I just want to give you a little bit of history about the Carpentries, if you're not familiar with them. Um, basically, we are a nonprofit uh, project that trains people in software development and data science skills for more effective work and career de development. We build community and local capacity for teaching and learning data skills and perspectives. And really, to put it simply, our vision is to be the leading inclusive community teaching data and coding skills. Now, you think about the carpentries, why the carpentries, what did that mean? Basically, when you think of the when you think of the word carpentries, it means basic, like learning how to nail two boards together to put a wall straight, right? And so each of our, we have three different lesson programs. And so each of them covers a particular basics. And so we have software carpentry, data carpentry, and library carpentry. And if you want to know more about the, the nitty gritty of that, I'd be more than happy to share with you about it. But really, I want to talk about Pre-COVID, our workshops were always in person two days, um, and they covered certain areas of topics uh, as shown here on the screen. Um, and then after COVID, we had to shift. And I was a huge, I was like, no way, Jose, are we going to in-person work to online workshops? That's not our thing. We are known for being uh for for that hands-on, that in-person um relationship building in the classroom. And so I was like, no. But unfortunately, if we wanted to stay running in an operation, we had to do something. And so today I want to talk to you about um, our shift and how we shifted from in-person to online workshops. And within this, I'll talk about some of the highs, the lows, some of the things we've learned. If once we figure out the new way of life, whatever our new norm is going to be, if we're going to keep it. And so our in-person uh, carpentry workshops, some of the features were the participatory live coding. And so participatory live coding, our instructors actually were live coding in front of the students um, and the students in the classroom were following along. Um, and so as the teacher was typing, as the instructor was typing something, the learner was typing something. Um, our workshops in person had helpers and co-instructors. And so with this, whenever the instructor was teaching, if someone, we, we're known for our stickies, um, whenever someone had a question of the sort, they can put a sticky on their computer and we know that they needed assistance. Um, and then we follow a robust code of conduct. So just as Elizabeth did when we first started, we have a, a strong um, code of conduct. And so there are just a few things that definitely stood out about our in-person workshops that we wanted to try to um, mirror or imitate when it was time to switch over to these online workshops. And so 
we realized this model was hard to translate. And so if you see the top picture, that is a picture of one of our workshops online. As you can see, they're stickies. Everyone is next to each other. And, you know, you have their computer set up and the instructor is in front of the room. They have a whiteboard and they have a large screen. And then when you look at an online workshop, even just trying to put the smaller picture on the on the, on the um, PowerPoint, it was difficult. But as you look at this, um, the bottom picture, you're trying to put everything that you would have on your board and on your white screen on one screen for someone to mirror um, in our classrooms, in our online classrooms. And it's been a process. And so some of the challenges that we think about um, the limited screen space. So again, in classrooms, you're able to use that, um, use your whiteboard or your projector screen and make it as big as possible so that the students everywhere can see them. And now you're trying to put everything into this one little 15, 17 inch. And maybe if you're lucky, you have a second screen that might be a 30 inch. So you might not, you know, some people may not have that uh, difficulty, but you have that. And then you have the hidden faces. And as we know, in classrooms, when you are teaching, it's really good to be able to see the students, the participants faces and be able to read the room so that you know if you need to slow down or if you don't. But just the same as in this workshop right now, um, we ask the, we're asking everyone to turn their cameras off to be able to preserve bandwidth. So right now, I don't know if you're laughing at my jokes. I don't know if you're nodding at me or you're like, what is she talking about? Um, the other thing is no sticky notes. And so, as I mentioned in that picture before, you see that there's some green stickies, you see some pink stickies. We really do use those as a way to gauge where we are in the process of teaching, if people are uh, following along, if they're good to go, it's more like a thumbs up, thumbs down. But, you know, we don't have that visibility. So now on an online workshop, we are trying to, you know, look for hands and people may use a different type of hand. As we know in Zoom, you can put the hand in the reaction or there's another little box where you can put a hand or a thumbs up. So trying to um, follow along with all that can be a little much on an instructor. And then those side conversations. Um, when you think about um, conversations, it's an opportunity to network in online workshops. You know, you might have gotten stuck somewhere and you can look over, or it may be, you know, you're just having a camaraderie. Now with, you know, carpet with the workshops, you have to have those dedicated channels. And again, as Elizabeth mentioned earlier, you know, the Zoom for us today is to be able to ask those questions. So it's hard to have those side conversations um, unless you want to do, you know, a, a Slack message or something. But then you're adding more things to your screen to try to keep up with. Um, helpers. Helpers in our online, in our online platform, they were used to really um assist those instructors when you see that there's a red sticky or a pink sticky up for someone that doesn't, uh, that's not following along or need more assistance, that helper can run to that person or walk to that person and sit down and help them. Whereas now it's a little bit difficult, whereas maybe you want to put them in a breakout room, but if you put a person in a breakout room, they're missing the instruction. And so really trying to figure out the utilization of the helpers and where they fit in our instruction was definitely something for us to consider. And then again, that socialization, it just doesn't happen as, as uh, organically as it would in an in-person workshop. When we take those breaks, you're generally turning off your camera or it's already off and you're walking away. Um, and so that was another great thing about our workshops because we would have people coming from different departments or you know people who may have uh, who may have never known each other who now can form this camaraderie. Maybe they realize that you know what I'm struggling too. You're struggling too. Okay, let's get this and figure this thing out together. But again, that's another hard part. So when we talk about the tips and suggestions and the lessons learned about the carpentries in our workshops. I'll, I'll tell you, um, we are still changing. Every, um, whenever we are still seeking feedback and asking the instructors and even the workshop hosts to share with us their, um, share with us their information or share with us their experiences. And we are learning over time that, you know, an in-person workshop, 
isn't the same. We know isn't the same as an online workshop, but also that maybe us trying to, you know, mirror the two shouldn't have been our focus because they are totally different aspects. And so when you think about um, our Carpentries instructional team, just starting off with who teaches the workshop, um, we do have a policy within the Carpentries that we never teach alone. And everyone on the instructional team, they should have a, a role. And so I mentioned some of the roles earlier, you would have your instructor and you'd have your helper. But now um, we're trying to figure out, okay, how many helpers do you have? How many you know, instructors do you have? And so we do have our instructor and that instructor ideally when they're up teaching, they should only be teaching. They should not have to worry about if, you know, if the technology is working right. Um, we want their focus to be on teaching. And then we have a supporting instructor. This is a new role that we introduced. Um, our curriculum, all of our instructors go through a two-day intensive um, instructor training to become certified to teach our workshops. Um, and at the time when we were switching to online workshops, our instructors did not have any, we did not have anything in our curriculum to talk about how to teach online workshops. And so what we introduced was a supporting instructor role to be able to um, allow those instructors who are new instructors, um, who may have just, uh, who have just received their certification to kind of shadow experienced instructors who are more comfortable and willing to, you know, take the first feet at teaching an online workshop. And so that's where the supporting and work, uh, the supporting instructor comes along. Um, and then we have those helpers. Again, those helpers are those persons who don't have to be affiliated with our workshop, but they understand um, the content that will be taught in the workshops and will be an extra set of eyes and ears to be able to assist the instructor. That way, the instructor can focus on um, teaching. Um, there are different types of helpers we've come to find out um, with online workshops. You may have a technical helper, or you may have uh, so someone who's just assisting with technical problems, or you may have someone who assists with breakout rooms if you decide to use breakout rooms in your workshop. Um, and then you have that facilitator. And that is someone who kind of watches for the uh, watches for questions. They step in if the instructor connection fails, they manage muting, you know, so kind of what Elizabeth is doing right now, admitting people into the room. So that's their sole focus. And so we realized that some of the things to consider when we're doing our online training versus our in-person training, one is the communication channel. Um, what is the primary, uh, what's the primary tool that you're going to use? So, you know, maybe it's the Zoom chat, or maybe it's the Etherpad chat, or maybe it's, you know, Slack, but you want to make sure that uh, you keep the noise down in the areas that's specific for instructor, um, for questions and answers. That way, you know, the, the, the participants don't get lost in those conversations. And it's good for the instructors and the helpers to have their, se their own separate um, communications channel. So maybe that is a separate, you know, Slack channel or WhatsApp. And then when you think about troubleshooting, when you have troubleshooting, in-person workshops, generally a workshop, we would say it's going to start at nine o'clock, but it's really not going to start till 10. That first hour is for this uh, participants to come in and um, answer, ask questions. Maybe they had hard times installing the software or, you know, their computer just isn't working right. You want to make sure you know, we have to figure out where do we put that time in and how do we even help persons with those installation problems? And so what we have learned is maybe you want to host an installation setup party prior to that workshop. So right now we're seeing that workshop uh, workshop hosts and instructors, maybe the day before, they give a two to three hour block and say, hey, during this time, come check in, make sure that you can download all the system software. And if not, you know, we need to look at something, another opportunity, but you're not waiting till the day of to try to figure that out. Um, also, consider using a cloud-based option that's ready to hand out to learners with unresolved problems. So we did, uh, within the Carpentries, we created a scaffolding um, online cloud base. So therefore, while in our workshops, we want people to try to mirror the instructor and download the software, 
in the worst case scenario, playing Z, 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 not sleeping, but, you know, um, for the worst case scenario, we ask, you know, we would have this cloud based server so that people can just go to this link and they'll mirror what the instructor is doing. Um, and then you just also want to think about having a backup of all solutions um, ready for when things fail or ask the host to prepare a list of backup options. Um, the other thing, when you think about that troubleshooting uh, bandwidth, that was, you know, another area that you have to think about for each individual participant. Whereas before, when you were, when we were in person, you, if there was a, you know, issue in a room, you can possibly switch rooms. So, you know, you have to think about that troubleshooting. And then formative assessment. assessment. In the Carpentries, we ask instructors to actively assess our learners while they teach and um, whether in video conferencing or chat features, we try to use whatever we can to leverage that. It's really important um, for the instructors to kind of know where they are to get a gauge where the where the learners are. Um, and that way, if they need to you know, change how they're teaching, if they need to slow down, maybe they need to go over a section that, you know, people didn't understand. And if they see that there's, a, you know, over half of the participants didn't understand it, okay, we need to go back before moving further. And so some of the things that we, we try to introduce is usually nonverbal feedback in Zoom, um, maybe, you know, putting a hands up or something in the chat, um, using the polls, which is a feature that Zoom does have, um, using the chat feedback. So maybe just saying and, and asking the learners to say done in the chat if they were asked to do an example or to do an exercise. Um, and maybe it's just an emoji, but again, trying to use some type of way to continue to gather that formative assessment for the instructors to know how they're doing with their teaching. And then we have note taking. And so again, in the classroom in the in-person classroom when you think about you know you have a whiteboard you have a flip chart and you have all these other avenues you want to still be able to make sure that those learners have access to all of the different resources that you're offering them while they're while you're teaching and so one of the things that you want to do um, some of the things that we use we have etherpad hack md um, maybe it's a google doc but whatever these tools are the ones that i mentioned they do translate well um, you think about it the primary challenge is the screen the screen space you don't want to have you know google docs up here and then your shell over here then your you know your personal notes over here and then a chat box over here it'll make it confusing for yourself and the learner and so you want to make sure that um, if there is a chat feature, you want to make sure that the, the participants know which chat to use, how to use it, um, making sure that they have a, you know, if you're going to use a Google Doc, making sure that it's visible, but also respecting the privacy, making it clear that sharing contact information in any of these um, in any of these documents is a, a personal preference and that the, their personal information will not be shared. Okay, awesome. And then lastly, feedback. Again, we talked about, you know, at the Carpentries, we encourage everyone to collect feedback. So finding different ways to collect that feedback um, is important for us. So, you know, however you want to do it, try to get that feedback so that you make sure that you understand what's happening with your learners. And lastly, the conclusion. For us, online workshops provide a different experience. As much as we tried to replicate it, we realized that it's just not gonna, it's not gonna be that same experience as in person. However, um, you're you're not gonna you you will not cover as much information and is not as interactive and networkable, but it still gives that foundation of what we want to do, the foundation of the resources that we want to share and for the participants to learn. Um, online workshops, they do fill a gap though. That is a great thing because prior to COVID, we were not offering online workshops and we had people that asked all the time, can we do this workshop online? Can you record it? And we were not doing that. And so now we're able to go in several regions that we weren't considering thinking about going into and they have opportunities to um, get, they have the advantage of utilizing our resource and also giving our instructors an opportunity to teach further as well. Um, some of our instructors weren't able to teach because they had to travel somewhere and it was too far. It didn't fit their time zone. Now we have that option for instructors to be able to teach all over the world. 
Um, it will not replace in workshop uh, in person workshops, but we know that we are going to keep them around again to be able to fill that gap. Um, people enjoy. Uh, traveling to new places and teaching and meeting new people. So that is one of the perks of teaching online because our instructors got a chance to travel. Um, and then we also realize that in certain areas, bandwidth makes it difficult to perform on in-person work, uh, online workshops. So taking that to consideration, we will still need to make sure that we do do those in-person workshops um, when time permits. And lastly, reevaluate the value of our online workshops. Um, depending on your organization and your mission, um, that'll help you decide whether or not you want to um, keep, if you want to continue to offer online workshops, if that's something that you, um, something that you did do during COVID. For us, for the Carpentries, we realized that virtual learning has become a new way of life. And as much as I didn't want it to uh, happen, it is our hope that, you know, over time we can perfect it. That's all. Thank you so much. And I'll open it up to Elizabeth for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we can have time for a few quick questions here. So Nicole asks, you said the online workshops didn't cover as much material. Why so in your experience? Yes. So what happens is in the in, uh, online workshops, you have to go a little bit slower because you have to stop and make sure everyone understands. You're not able to read the room as clearly. And so and also, it may be someone's first time, you know, working on a computer. This is all new to them. So trying to not only figure out how to work in an online environment, um, it, it just takes some time for the instructors to get everyone engaged and on the same page where it would. Whereas in person, you still have those helpers that could also kind of help move you along, um, move those persons who are a little bit behind along. So that's one of the, some of the caveat to, to having, not being able to complete as much of the material as possible. But the good thing is all of our curriculum is open source. So if we do not cover it, all of our learners do have access to that to continue um, the to further their own individual learning. Great, and then Coral asks, um, is there anything that you find that's better online than in person? I would say the biggest thing is, you know, time. Some people just, you know, a lot of people are able to attend our workshops now and even teach our workshops because they are online. Um, and it opens us up, you know, it opens it up to globally. We have participants who from all time zones participating in our workshops. And that is now possible because they are online, whereas before um, they were not able to do that. So for us, that's the biggest win is that we have a wider reach now. I have to agree. I've been able to teach more workshops because it's online with the Carpentries than at least like with locally, because we can also run evening ones now, which we couldn't do. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So can we give a nice, lovely chat set of applause <laughs> to share um, the Carpentries? I don't know if you want to put some links about the Carpentries into the chat. I will. So people can uh, enjoy that. They, full disclosure, I've been working with the Carpentries since 2015. So um, I love the mission of the Carpentries and it has helped me um, be just so much of, it gave me so many opportunities to, to teach and get some experience. Um, especially being able to sort of constantly iterate when you're teaching, when you have an opportunity to teach the same material four times in one semester, you have four times um, the opportunity to iterate and get better at it. And so uh, it just lets you iterate and get fast, get better faster than you can really on this whole semester level. Alrighty. So for our next um, talk, we are gonna be hearing from Reuven Lerner. Uh, who unfortunately couldn't attend because he is teaching at the moment. <laughs> He's doing a tutorial. Um, so he gave me a, he pre-recorded his talk. Um, there was some slight, there was like an audio blip at the beginning, causing it to be off a little bit in sync. I was able to clean it up and fix it in iMovie really quickly just before we started. And so um, I hope, I, but I haven't had a chance to see it all the way through. So if there's weird sync issues, I did my best for it. So I'm gonna go ahead and get VLC shared here. Um, and 
So he will not be able to take uh, questions. <laughs> that is so uh nicole there has a great comment it, it, being able to do online is you can you can do be in two places at once i've literally done this with two separate zoom sessions before i had like office hours in one zoom session and i was teaching a workshop in another zoom session all right let me get find vlc in here there we go okay and i'm gonna share sound so please in chat, let me know when I get this started. Oh, I have to, I've not shared audio before, so I have to. Let's see here. Hopefully this looks okay to everyone. Let me know if it doesn't. I'll be looking at the chat as we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and click play now. If you can all let me know if you hear, <laughs> um, if you hear the audio, okay. All right. Point. Hi there, this is Ruben. Really happy to be participating in PyCon's 2021 Trainer Summit. I am extremely disappointed that I am actually at this very moment doing some training. So I'm uh, appreciative to Elizabeth and the other folks involved in the summit for allowing me to record this talk. This talk is called, Don't Make These Mistakes, because I already did. So just a few words about myself. I have been in business for myself for over 25 years. Um, and for more than a decade, I've been a full-time Python trainer. Um, and I teach everything from Python for non-programmers to advanced workshops, often on-site courses for companies. Strangely, in the last year and a half, I have not been doing very much on-site, but rather I have been doing everything on Zoom and WebEx for companies all around the world. And I also have a, a suite of online courses that I sell to companies and individuals, including weekly Python exercise. And it will come as a huge surprise to you that I have made mistakes in my career as a trainer. I've made all sorts of mistakes, but guess what? Most mistakes are not fatal to your career, right? As long as you don't like take an ax to people in your course or set fire to your client's offices or say something really horrible and terrible and discriminatory and nasty, you're probably going to be okay. And in fact, most of the time, people are not even going to notice your mistakes. And that's great because you can learn from your mistakes. And in this talk, I'm gonna share some of my mistakes, some of the mistakes that I've made most often during my training that I've tried to wean myself off of and tried to improve from and thus improve myself as a trainer. And I'm gonna divide these into four different types of mistakes, business mistakes, pedagogical mistakes, language mistakes, and logistical mistakes. By the way, I'm sure that I've forgotten some types of mistakes. I guess that's a fifth type of mistake, yeah? All right, anyway, another mistake, letting me make jokes. All right, let's start off with business mistakes. So the biggest thing that people worry about is pricing, right? And 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 so now this assumes that you already have clients, that you're talking to clients, or at least potential clients, and you're starting to negotiate pricing. And I should say, um, it's a whole different set of mistakes in terms of finding clients. That's hard. That's hard no matter what you do. And whatever you can do to get clients, go for it. But once you start talking to someone about pricing, it's very tempting, especially at first, to like say, well, I really enjoy teaching. I want everyone to know about Python. I don't have to charge them that much. And that's very nice of you. And no company or very few companies are gonna tell you that you're making a mistake here. But don't sell yourself short. You are providing real business value. You are helping their people to be more productive. And if they're more productive, they're going to be while well, helping their company, their organization become more productive and thus make more money. And if their company is making more money, guess what? It's worth it for them to pay you some of that money. So don't sell yourself short. It's really okay to charge a reasonable amount for pricing. Now, that doesn't mean you should be totally crazy greedy, right? And there is a bit of a, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's kind of some wiggle room in there. And I know I'm not being specific, but you're going to have to feel out your particular market for what you're selling and, and the customers that you deal with and what they're willing to pay. The other thing is don't give in too quickly on discounts. It's very common for someone to ask for a discount and, and especially newbies are like, oh, well, I'll give them a discount and then they'll work with me. Sometimes they will actually keep working with you even if you don't give them a discount. Now there are exceptions. So one of my favorite examples is I had a company call me and say, listen, if you, what can you give us in terms of a discount? And I said, I don't discount. And the woman on the other end of the phone said, listen, if you don't give me a discount, the head of the company is not going to approve the training. You have to give me something, something. 
So I said to her, well, what if we knock off like 50 shekel a day? Shekels are what we use here in Israel for currency. And that turns out to be like $15. And she said, sold. And since then, every time I do training for them, I knock $15 a day off of the price. They are happy as clams about this. And I think, you got to be kidding me. By the way, when I go to their office, they pay for my lunch. I'm sure I get more than a $15 lunch. So there you go. What about raising prices? So clients don't want you to raise prices. And if you call them up and say, hey, I now charge more, they are not going to be happy about it. And they might start giving you a real pushback. They might even say, well, we won't be able to do that much with you anymore. So my solution to this, <clears throat> after making mistakes on this for many years, is I first raise prices on new clients. People I haven't worked with before, they call me up, they ask, what is my price? And I sort of feel out the market by giving these new potential clients my pricing. If they don't take it, if none of them take the new price, maybe it's too high. And so I ratchet it down a little bit. And once I've actually started, or once I've raised my price to a new level on my new clients, then I can go back to my old clients and say, listen, everyone else is paying such and such. I really don't like, if we want to keep working together, you've got to pay the market value. And they typically are okay with that. They'll often say, okay, but don't raise prices again on us for another three years, to which I think, all right, then that's, that's fine. I'll, I'll write that down in my calendar. And indeed, I do that. I put in my calendar, come back in three years and talk to this client about raising prices again. So <clears throat> some clients will want you to sign a contract with them. And they will love to say that this is a standard contract, right? That is the most overworn phrase in the contracting world. Standard contract, standard contract. There is no such thing. If you need to change something, talk to them about it. There's some things they won't agree to change. But there's some things that they will. And it took me a long time again to sort of get over this idea of, well, they have fancy lawyers and they have this very fancy document. Clearly, none of it is meant to be changed. All of it is subject to debate or all of it is subject to negotiation. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you do need to talk to them about it a little bit. Give an example. There was a client I went to in the US, uh, I guess about a year and a half ago before the pandemic, two years ago almost. And um, their contract included a requirement that I pay for auto insurance. Now, I was not planning to rent a car. In fact, I told them I was not planning to rent a car. And they said, well, like, there's nothing we can do about that. I said, really, I have to pay for auto insurance, even though and show you the insurance uh, um, voucher, show you the insurance uh, claim, I guess the policy, even though I'm not going to be renting a car. So they added to the contract. They changed the contract saying as a special rider sort of outside of it, I guess a special appendix to it, that I did not need to get auto insurance. But then I was required to only take taxis and Ubers and walk and not use a car. All right, that was agreeable. So if you need to change something, you feel like you need to change something, talk to them about it. They will often be reasonable, although bigger clients, less reasonable sometimes. Invoices. This is going to sound silly. Don't forget to invoice your clients. Yes, I do this. I do this surprisingly often. You know, I'm dealing with so many clients and so many classes and oh, something just sort of falls between the cracks. So I actually had a client call me, uh, I guess like last year, and say, hey, you kind of forgot to invoice us for four courses we did last year. Four courses. Oh, my God, what a mistake. Um, but we have it on our books. You <laughs> Really, we want to pay you. Now, this was very nice of them. This is a big company where it's all very well established and formalized. So if they don't pay me, like something is wrong um, and they get into trouble for not, I don't know, using their budgets or, or fulfilling their purchase orders. So I invoiced them and they paid me and all was good. So don't make that mistake invoice your clients. And by the way, when you invoice them, then you get paid. So that's kind of a nice thing. Another thing, upsell. For a long time, I was under the impression that they sort of could read my mind or they would constantly be on my website and they would see what I teach, what new things I teach and what I can offer them. No, you have to tell them. So if they, if you, if you've been teaching an intro class, like an intro Python class, then you can ask them, would you also like an advanced Python class? Maybe you're interested in data science with Python. Would you like that? And you'd be shocked how often they say, yes, we would love to have that, especially if they're super happy with the courses you've already taught. Oh, well, they like the advanced class. How about testing? How about security? How about a practice workshop in which we just go through large projects? Better yet, you can ask them what courses they want you to teach. And then you can develop those courses and then you can sell them those courses. It's kind of amazing. I know, like it sounds kind of crazy, but if you say to them, what kind of courses would you like? And they say, well, we would like X and Y and Z. And then you come back to them and say, I now have courses in X and Y and Z. And they say, how did you know? That's exactly what we need. And then they buy them. Now it's not going to work 100% of the time, but it works enough of the time that it's you know, definitely worth trying. And um, I mean, sometimes if you have something that's 
not quite obviously related to what you teach, they'll also be happy. So for example, one client I was talking to, um, I was talking to the training manager and I mentioned something about Git. And she said, oh, you teach Git also? And I said, yes, I, I do. I've been teaching it for many, many years. She said, oh, I can't believe it. We just signed a contract with someone to teach our people Git courses. It's a shame we didn't know. Well, to my uh, great fortune, about two or three months later, this training manager called me and said, listen, the Git course we got from this other person is terrible. How would you like to teach us Git? Since then, I've been teaching a Git course every quarter for four or five years now. So that's just because I happened to mention this and they have no idea. They're not looking at your website. Almost none of my clients look at my website. So I am sort of obligated to tell them what I teach and how I teach it. Language mistakes. This is kind of a funny one, um, but I think it's important to give it a sort of its own section. The language you use as an instructor has huge influence. And I'll tell you where I get a lot of the feedback on this from. It's from my own work. So those of you who know me uh, um, or subscribe to my newsletters, you know that I have this hobby slash obsession for the last number of years. I, I take almost daily lessons in Chinese, Mandarin Chinese. I love it. It is super fun, interesting, also useful when I go to China. Um, and as a student, I am on the receiving end out of a lot of language that sometimes feels harsh or bad from my teacher. And I've noticed this and I've started trying to incorporate these uh, this feedback or this feeling that I have into when I teach. So here's a word you should never use, obviously. This will obviously do that, right? Obviously, attributes are objects that belong to other objects. No, it's not obvious. It's obvious to you because you are an expert. It's not obvious to the student. And they will feel kind of dumb about this, right? Because if you say obviously, they're like, oh, it wasn't obvious to me. Huh, I guess I missed something. Or here's one that I always say that I really, really try not to. Let's do a simple exercise. If it's a simple exercise, well, like, and they don't get it, they're going to feel kind of dumb. You don't want them to feel dumb. You want them to feel like it's challenging. Yes, it's hard. Yes, they might need some help. Yes, they might not even finish. But the moment you call it simple, that is already putting pressure on them to feel like, well, if I didn't get this, it's kind of dumb. Um, here's another one that I, I, I used to say a lot, and I definitely, definitely wean myself off of, as I said before. So someone, you're talking about something. So let's say I'm talking about, I don't know, generator functions. And someone asked me a question about it. I say, oh, yes, I, I said before that generator functions uh, use yield instead of return. Well, guess what? If they had remembered what you said before, they would not be asking your question, their question now. And so it just sort of belittles them. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I actually get this from my Chinese instructor, and she doesn't mean anything bad from it. She's like, oh, you don't remember this word? We learned this before. And every time she says that, I think, oh, you know, boy, I guess I should have remembered it. When, you know what? Humans don't remember everything we learn, or humans don't remember everything we hear, and it's definitely worth sort of trying to encourage them. So you don't have to say, as I said before, you just answer it. And the moment I started doing that with my language, I found that my students were very appreciative. They didn't say anything explicitly, but I could feel it. And I was no longer sort of making them feel bad for not remembering. It's okay. It's okay. Here's language you should use. Let's check. What do I mean by that? So if they say, what happens if I try to add a string and an integer together? Don't say, you'll get an exception. Say, let's check. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why I love using Jupyter when I'm teaching, because I go in and I show them how to check it themselves. Now, why would I do this? First of all, because I want to show them the process that I go through. They don't, no one's going to remember. Again, no one's going to remember everything I teach them, everything I tell them. But I do want them to get into the sort of mindset of always checking things. That I don't remember everything that happens, see how it happens in Python. I have to try it all the time. So if I say, let's check, we tried in Jupyter, they see this process. And then the next time they want to check something, they know they don't just look it up. They can try it. They can experiment. It gives them also a sense of experimenting, which is important, I think, with a programming language. You want to feel its sort of fluidity. The other thing is, because I work with Jupyter and I send them the Jupyter notebooks that I create after each course, this then gives them a record of what I did and they can try it out on their own after class is over. Let's talk about some pedagogical mistakes that I've made over the years. So don't teach too much. It's super, super tempting to teach everything you know about a subject, but you can't. It's going to overwhelm them. It takes time to absorb new ideas, new syntax. Um, I, when I look back at the syllabus that I had for the first time I taught Python in a big company, it's just laughable. I think I was teaching in two days intro syntax and functions and regular expressions and objects and generators. And I'm sure there were a few other things in there. And like, come on, I basically 
skim the surface. I, I didn't really give them a chance to practice anything. I didn't give them a chance to learn anything or absorb anything. And I found over the years that if I take a course and I remove, even a successful course, I remove content and I add labs, I add um, uh, um, exercises, people are happier. They come away really enjoying it. And here's a little you know, bonus. If you teach less material, then the content you have left over can be used in future classes. So a whole bunch of things I used to teach in my intro Python classes are now in my advanced Python class. By the way, these were the things that the people in the intro class were just struggling over hugely. So it was a stretch for me to teach that anyway in the intro class. It fits more naturally into an advanced class. And now I can really try to walk them through these ideas and make sure there's a, they are internalized as much as possible. Here's another one. Teach the material before the exercise. I know, I know, it seems obvious, right? But do you know how many times I give an exercise and I'm like, oh, wait, wait, I had to teach you about such and such first. So, um, for example, I love giving, a, um, you know, one of my exercises, favorite exercises is Pig Latin, right? You know, write a Pig Latin translator. And I use in to check if it's a, a vowel, you know, in A-I-O-U, and I use uh, slices. And the number of times that I've forgotten to teach either in or slices before giving this exercise is huge. Now, the thing is, if you forget to tell them, they're not going to tell you, hey, we don't know how to do this. Rather, they're going to just go searching on Stack Overflow, and then they're going to come up with all these really sophisticated solutions that have nothing to do with what you're trying to teach them. Um, Stack Overflow has been a bit of a game changer because they feel empowered to go look for things, which is fine, but they don't feel limited by what you've actually taught them. Sample files. You want to make files available for them to then react to, work with, and whatever. I used to email them to people, but now I just put them all on a server, and they can download the appropriate zip file. My email used to get lost in spam or junk, and this way you can update the files. Here's a mistake that I've made a number of times. Make sure the encoding is right. So working with people in Python 3, if I give them something that's encoded in like Latin 1, it'll you know, blow up on them, and I, I made that mistake. Oops. So make sure the encoding is right. And I even had people, I think I was teaching a course in Shanghai at some point, and people were working and working and working for like 15 minutes, and someone finally calls me over and says, hey, I think there's a problem with the encoding here. I was like, oh yes, nothing's going to work. Did anyone else encounter this problem? And everyone's hands go up. So people aren't going to complain. They're going to assume this is part of the exercise. So, oops. How about too easy or too hard, right? Let's say your course is too easy or it's too hard. That's going to be a problem. Everyone comes up with different knowledge. And you don't want to hear after the course that the material was like too bad in one direction or the other. So one solution is to have a pre-course survey. This is especially good at new companies you're working with. Um, and so you can ask them, how do you feel? Like, how well do you know comprehensions on a scale from one to five or objects one to five or any of this? I use one to five. And then if the training manager complains, you can say, look, this is the survey results that I got. So I sort of thought that this was appropriate. Remember that your students aren't experts. This is sort of like what I mentioned earlier, right? So giving explanations that make sense to experts won't work. You need to think about things from a beginner's perspective. And this takes several attempts. So try your explanations in a blog, on YouTube, on Twitter, user group meetings. And over time, your explanations will get better. And they'll be more and more appropriate for beginners so that you can then use them in class. Now, here I call this use ignorance as an opportunity. If you don't know the answer to a question, that's good. Someone once told me this great phrase, that a good question is one in which the student doesn't know the answer, but an excellent question is one where the teacher does not know the answer. And I show them how I find the answer. I show them the process so that they will understand that not everyone knows everything, right? I've been using Python for close to 30 years, and I still don't understand every part of the language. Just last year, I discovered the round function in built-ins. Who knew? Who knew? Well, everyone except me. And here's some logistical mistakes. So. People would complain because I use Jupyter and I don't use slides. They were like, well, uh, they would complain in the sort of the course survey. We, we want to know what the agenda is for each day. So now I start the every day with an agenda and I end every day with a next time. Guess what? And then the next day, and it doesn't have to be the next day because sometimes companies want to split it up over time. I can look at that next time and that becomes the agenda. So it's useful for me also, but it's definitely useful. Definitely, definitely useful for my students. Get places early. I'm terrible at this. Get places early. Things will go wrong. The projector won't work. The microphone, headphones, Bluetooth won't work, especially for like online courses, WebEx and Zoom. How many times has a company given me a WebEx address and it doesn't quite work? I once went into someone else's course because both of us were given the same uh, address. You need to get in early so that when these things happen, and they won't happen all the time, but they'll sometimes happen if you want to take care of it. Redundancy. This is really true if you're traveling, but bring a charger or more than one for your laptop. Bring a phone charger, because like it's kind of embarrassing to have to ask your students for a phone charger. Bring video cables for all the different adapters. Here's another fun one. When should you finish? 
every company is different about this. And so if you have a course that's four days long, nine to five, sounds good, right? Many companies I've been with, the last day people leave after lunch or they expect to leave a little after lunch. Um, <laughs> so now it's kind of like uh, a little hard to ask them about this, but you do need to check. And if you don't check, just be prepared to be surprised. Again, most mistakes are invisible. And so your students are gonna assume whatever you do is normal. You've been in many classes, they've only been in a few. Learn from the reactions, try to monitor them, figure out what they think about what you're doing. And every class is an opportunity to improve on the previous time uh, so that you can make new mistakes for your benefit and yours. And above all, have fun. If you're enjoying teaching, your students will likely enjoy it too. They'll see this as a fun thing to learn and a fun thing to do. All right, folks. Again, I'm really sorry that I'm not around to answer the questions in person. I would love to hear from you. Whatever questions, comments you have, you can email me, catch me on Twitter. I post often about Python stuff. Go to my website, sign up for my newsletters. I have a free weekly article about Python at betterdevelopersweekly.com. And I have free weekly articles about the tech training business at trainerweekly.com. Thank you so much. All right, and there you can sort of see the rest of the audio that didn't show up in there. So I'm super glad that worked. I will leave this last slide open for a little bit so you can take whatever screenshots you need to get that going. And then I'm gonna check our schedule to get the next person. So let's do a nice chat round of applause for Ruben and thank you, thank him. Um, yeah, that's, there's a lot of great advice, especially for people who are thinking about starting up into training or thinking about doing workshops, thing, other things like that. So, all right, next up, we are running a little bit late in time. So, but I think um, we're not gonna cut anything, but if you need to leave it to leave, but we'll go ahead and continue on with everything for the um, lightning talks and stuff at the end. I think technically we have until we have an extra hour if we need it. So. Um, yeah, go ahead and let's start up here with Sebastian. Uh, let me make you a co-host here so you can uh, share your screen and do the business. All righty, I see your screen. Hey, uh, can you see me? Because Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, good. Okay, so uh, 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 hi, welcome. My name is Sebastian. Uh, my talk is going to be a little bit different than, than the previous uh, two. Uh, I'm basically going to tell you about how we at my company transitioned uh, to a fully remote working environment. Um, and especially we're going to focus on how we transition to coaching junior developers uh, in a remote world. So first, let me uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm 35 years old. I live in the Netherlands. Uh, which you can probably hear by my accent. Uh, and I work for uh, an IT service provider here in the Netherlands. Uh, it's called Ordina. We have about two and a half thousand uh, uh, employees. And we mainly operate in the Netherlands, Belgium and uh, Luxembourg. Um, and I work there as a senior Python developer. Uh, and one of my roles there is to um, work on sharing knowledge between employees but also coaching junior developers and thinking about how we can uh, make our Python unit better. Uh, I have previous teaching experience at a university. I worked at Leiden University for about 10 years in various forms from small tutorials to larger scale lectures and everything in between. So I, uh, so I took that experience with me when I transitioned into software development. And I'm also one of the three owners of Python Discord, which is an online platform for Python enthusiasts. And we also do a lot of uh, online teaching there, but it's obviously mostly in chat form. But still, uh, I think it's a great experience to explain things to mostly teenagers and uh, students who are learning Python. You really have to think about how you teach Python. So that's about me. So uh, now let's talk about remote coaching and why bother. This may sound like a weird kind of question uh, at this moment. We're over a year into a, a, a pandemic and a lot of companies have transitions to fully remote working. But at the same time, if you go back a year or a year and a half, uh, a lot of companies uh, were used to working from the office. Everyone was in the office and a lot of our coaching practices, a lot of our teaching practices are focused around being able to talk to someone to just um, 
see someone, uh, ask a question, get up, walk over to someone. Uh, so a lot of uh, companies initially ask themselves, so why bother investing in remote coaching? Well, things have changed. A lot of companies these days are considering to continue with remote working, which in my opinion also means is that you need to invest in remote coaching. You need to think about how you do it, but you also need to train people. Uh, and you probably need to spend a little bit more time than you are used to uh, in coaching sessions. Now, I also think it's really important for companies that want to continue with partial remote working. It's a really big issue, a uh, really big thing here in the Netherlands. I work for an IT service company. We typically work at clients and most of them have already indicated that they want to continue with remote working for at least two to three days uh, a week. Some of them want to continue full time. Um, and I think that remote coaching is a really big aspect in that context as well. Uh, and specifically because a lot of the coaching and education we do takes place outside of uh, planned sessions. And uh, um, so when I coach someone, uh, I typically just help them while we're working on a project. We're, we're uh, tackling uh, a ticket or a user story or whatever you'd like to call that. It's a very natural way of coaching and helping someone and training someone in doing their job. Uh, and obviously you can schedule uh, big training sessions. Uh, every junior developer comes into the company every second Friday, but when everyone's working remotely uh, parts of the week, those natural occurring uh, remote coaching sessions uh, are a lot more difficult. Uh, we also can't just stop hiring junior uh, developers. And this is basically what happened uh, a year and a half ago. A lot of companies just uh, realized that they didn't really know how to train junior developers in a remote world. So they stopped hiring them uh, temporarily. I think it's very healthy for a team and for a company to have a healthy balance. It's very important for your future. So you, we obviously cannot hire, uh, stop hiring junior developers. So in a, in a world that's probably going to be a little bit more remote than what we were used to, we uh, need to focus on remote coaching. Um, and the other aspect why you really need to think about remote coaching is that it, uh, it comes with its own unique challenges and needs. And if you don't take those into account, um, basically your junior developers are not going to be happy. They're not going to be learning as much. They may lose their way in your company. Um, they may even leave your company. So you should really think about how you train uh, your junior developers, even if you don't see them every day. So what are those challenges and needs? Um, I have not seen a lot of interactivity in the session yet. Normally, I just ask people for input when I'm giving talks. So maybe uh, we can think about this together. Is it OK? I'm looking at our host, but I cannot see her right now. Do whatever you need to do. It sounds fun. Yeah. So maybe if, if people have suggestions, well, what kind of challenges do, do you see when it comes to remote uh, coaching? Where's my chat? My chat has disappeared. Yeah, just to be sure, uh, please put your answers in the chat. And um, uh, I can read them off uh, for you, Sebastian, so you can focus on parsing them for your activity summary, um, or you can ah. read them off. Right, so I see here uh, pair programming is, uh, is much, much harder. That's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a really good point. Uh, helping newer developers uh, is striking a balance between asking questions too often or uh, versus not enough. So you need to create those interactive moments, but you also need to give them a little bit of freedom. And how do you manage that in a remote environment? It's my translation of that. So uh, to continue, here are a few things that, that I considered uh, when thinking about this. Uh, and the first one is the, the indeed the social environment. You just don't meet people at, uh, at the water cooler. Um, and this isn't only for those informal chats, because that's obviously very important in a working environment. You spend a lot of time at work, so you need to be able to connect socially. But it's also very important uh, to help you find your way in a company. If you don't meet people, you don't know who knows what. You don't know who can help you with something. And if you have a question, who do you ask? It's a very big step to just call up someone and ask them a question. A lot of our uh, junior developers struggle with that. They struggle with picking up the phone or just going into a video uh, conference call with someone. Uh, so working remotely makes this more difficult because you don't just meet people and uh, you don't you, you cannot just ask them a question. Um, so uh, the interactive work environment, this is also very difficult. So how do you get those nice peer-to-peer -peer interactions, those senior to junior interactions? How do you do 
uh, pair programming. Um, what I always really like about junior developers is if they help each other. So someone's stuck and then someone else says, well, let's look at it together. We grab that PC and let's solve the problem together. Uh, I also really like when people just uh, try to solve some something, but if they're stuck for more than uh, 30 minutes or, or 45 minutes, they just ask me, can you take a look with me? Maybe we can do it together. So how do you create such an interactive work environment when everyone's stuck at home staring at their own uh, computer monitor? Um, I also think that structure is really important. I like flexibility. I love flexibility. I like planning my own days. And remote working offers a unique chance in terms of flexibility, but it can also be a risk, uh, especially for some people. And I think you need to take that into account. And I think you sometimes need to help people um, uh, uh, create some structure in their working hours. You don't want someone working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, or at least I don't want them to, because I don't really think that's healthy and, and a long-term solution. Uh, and also distractions. Uh, distractions, it's really easy to become distractions, uh, distracted at home when you're just watching meetings or you're in meetings a lot or you're in one-way coaching sessions. I think it's much easier to just open a browser tab or get distracted by something that's going on and not get back to what you were doing. So you also need to deal with distractions. Now, there are probably a lot of other um, factors as well, but these are some of the things that you need uh, to think about. Um, so what do I know about all these factors? Well, first, I already mentioned it. Uh, I have about 10 years of experience in regular in-person teaching at a university. And in that period, we struggled a lot with uh, uh, doing stuff like recording our lectures and then putting them on online for, for students to watch at home or thinking about how can we transfer from regular teaching to, to uh, online teaching or remote teaching because students were really asking for those aspects. Um, what I also did recently is together with Sander Beekhuis, one of my colleagues, I set up a new remote coaching problem, uh, program for our new Python junior developers. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So how we set that up, what kind of challenges we had. Um, in that program, we focused on the first few months of employment. I see I combined two slides here. I'm just going to pre pretend it didn't happen. Uh, we focused on the first few months of employment because we really wanted to, to uh, have those people land in the company. Um, and we also, in our company, we also have a company-wide coaching pro uh, program uh, that I know a lot about. Uh, so that's uh, what I know about coaching. So what do we do? So we, what we try to do when we uh, uh, have junior developers come into the, the company, we try to enroll them in a special program. It's called the Young Professionals Program. And this is specifically aimed at people with little to no work experience, so zero to two years or thereabouts. Uh, it doesn't have to be development experience, just not a lot of uh, working experience. And we enroll them in our junior uh, professionals program. Now, this sounds like a kind of internship, but it's actually just a real job. It's just an entry-level job with just a regular entry-level uh, uh, pay. But we, uh, but we promise them that we're going to help them uh, uh, learn the, the, the tools of the trade, learn their soft skills and hard skills, and, and get started in their working life. Um, so we, we offer them a lot of learning opportunities, and we also try to get them a lot of hands-on experience. So those junior developers, they start working for clients as quickly as possible. Uh, these, centri uh, these, organized, uh, uh, these centrally organized training sessions, they mainly focus on the soft skills. So things like how do you, how do, you do a take-in session? How do you plan your career? How do you work on goals? Uh, we all know those kinds of uh, coaching sessions. And then Sander and I mainly focused on setting up a specific program for the junior developers that we have, because our company is much broader. We have Java developers, Microsoft developers, uh, functional programmers, front-enders. Uh, we have a lot of different kinds of developers and we focused on uh, junior Python developers and we set up a program to teach them hard skills of the job remotely. So how did we do that? Well, in the first month, we started off with a fully planned and structured program to help them land in the company. This was meant to give them a little bit of structure in their work to know when to start working, stop working, but also just to create a lot of social interaction uh, moments. We just plan sessions with them. Uh, we try to create an environment in which knowledge sharing occurs naturally. So obviously we, we planned a lot of uh, coaching sessions, but we also try to introduce digital 
uh, sessions uh, in which uh, we could work together, pair programming, in which knowledge sharing uh, occurs organically or naturally. So we uh, combined coaching sessions, we had stand-up meetings, and we did a learning project. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, but we also gave them the time to do some self-paced learning because that's also really important. And our eventual goal was to get those junior developers ready to start working in an enterprise project at a client after that first month. Uh, so the, the first important thing is ensuring a daily structure. And what we did, and this is really a lot of time, this takes a big time investment. Uh, we set up two daily stand-up meetings. They took about 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, and we started the day with one of them and we did one after lunch. And these included uh, uh, normal stand-up rituals. Developers are probably going to be familiar with them, but this means that we started off with, hey, what have you done since the previous meeting? What are you going to do until the next meeting? And is there anything you need help with? Are you blocked on something? Can we help you get unblocked? Now, normally you typically do this within the context of a project, but we just did it in general, just to discuss today and to know whether uh, uh, something, uh, whether they were stuck on something. And I think these meetings are really important. Um, but, with, uh, but since these meetings were a little bit longer, typically around 20 minutes, this also left plenty of time to discuss other stuff. Because this is one of the biggest things I struggled with. I started working for this company remotely as well, is that it's very difficult to know where to get information. So Sander and I, and we took turns, uh, or we were both at these meetings, we were very open to answering all of their questions. Things, very simple things like, how do you take a day off? Uh, who do you speak to when, you, when you're sick? Um, uh, if, I, if you want to learn something, where can you find a course for that? Can I buy books uh, and declare the, the costs at the company? So just to help them get started in the company. And I think this was a really important aspect of our program. Um, we also had teaching sessions. And those were planned in those first months. They had a lot of teaching sessions, about three to four each week. Uh, and for that, it's important that, that you find a good balance between active and, and, passion, uh, and passive sessions. What do I mean with that? Uh, well, if you think about uh, 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 sessions, you can have a very passive session for the students or for the uh, uh, junior developers, I should say, I'm no longer working for the university. Uh, but you can think about a very passive session uh, uh, like a lecture where, you, where there's just a, a teacher or a coach or a trainer just sending out information to uh, whoever's listening. And the, the one who's doing the listening is basically just listening. Those are very passive sessions. And then you have very active sessions like pair programming, where uh, you're basically always doing something actively uh, all the time. And I think it's really important when you do remote coaching that you find a, a good balance between those active and those special, uh, passive sessions. Uh, and especially if you do plan those one-way passive sessions, do keep in mind that they can be very taxing. Uh, people get tired, especially when they're virtual. So you need to take this into, uh, into account. And what we mostly did is we used them sparingly and we always combined them with an active session. So for instance, what I did, I gave a training about, about uh, Git, a version control system. So I talked about Git for about 30 minutes explaining what it is and how it works. And then we did a pair programming session, setting up a repository and getting them started on actually using the system. I think that's a really good combination of doing things. Uh, but for the most part of a program, we mainly stuck uh, uh, to interactive sessions. Now, what, what kind of interactive sessions uh, uh, did we use? Uh, well, first of all, we did a lot of pair programming and mob programming sessions. Someone in the chat already said that it's difficult. I don't really think it's that difficult to set up a good session. Basically, what you can start with is a good video conferencing program like Zoom or Microsoft Teams or any uh, other flavor that you want to use. And just someone shares their screen, they're the driver, they're typing in whatever you're working on. And then someone else, an onlooker, acts as a navigator and they're navigating the driver into what they're doing. And you can do this in pairs or in mobs, uh, which means there are more onlookers. And this is a really great way to uh, get those interactive, uh, natural knowledge sharing uh, happening. We also had a lot of traditional workshops, which are basically mixed short bursts of sending information, explaining something and like uh, Werner just said, you first explain something and then you actively apply it in an exercise. 
So for instance, one of our colleagues, Mark Hendricks, he had a beautiful workshop for the for implementing design patterns. He explained one, then everyone implemented it in their own programming language. And then we got back to discussing those uh, implementations. And then we went on to the next uh, programming design pattern. And another form that was really well received was self-paced tutorial sessions. You basically have a tutorial session uh, written out with an exercise book. Everyone starts working on the questions and we always keep an open mic. So if someone has a question, they just ask and the, the whole group chimes in. It's very interactive and a good example and one that you can find on the internet is Docker from Scratch by Evil Waltering. It's a really great uh, self-paced session that you can do in such an open mic setting in Zoom or in Microsoft Teams or whatever that you'd like to use. Um, I see that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go a little bit faster. We also did a, a training project, uh, and this was to uh, let them get used to working in an enterprise project. And basically what we did is we asked them to write a website uh, and they had to do everything that, that uh, developers need to know, like version control, CI, CD, for, uh, which most of you are probably familiar with. And uh, those aspects follow directly from those uh, interactive workshop sessions that we did. So we first taught them something, and then we asked, asked them to apply it in their own project. And then we did code reviews and uh, teach them that way. Um, and our junior developers were really happy with this. They really got a taste of what it's like to work in a project. And they felt confident that, that they can then go into a project for a client as well. Now, beyond that first month, uh, this is all in the first month, this very intense program. Beyond that first month, we continue to have those stand-up meetings, but twice a week. Uh, and the frequency of coaching sessions decreased to once per month or per two months. Uh, and they started working on an actual project for a client in a team. Um, and then we basically just promoted uh, interactive forms of working like pair programming and mob programming. Just uh, let someone share their screen or use the interactive uh, coding features added to things like PyCharm or Visual Studio Code. Um, and that works really well. And this, uh, this program continues for about a year. And after that, they're uh, out of the Young Professionals program and ready to start uh, uh, fully working on their own, we hope. What remained a challenge for us was the social aspect. Uh, people don't just meet. So while you obviously have a lot of interaction with people within your own team, how do you uh, uh, let junior developers meet people outside of the team? We don't really have a good solution for that. I'm open to suggestions. Uh, what we did was organize regular unit meetings and a unit lunch every two to three weeks where everyone in our Python unit, about 35 developers, uh, they all called into a, a central session and we ate lunch together and we had a small uh, lunch uh, presentation. What we also do is randomized uh, organized video meetings. We basically uh, combine two random people from our units together and say, you're now going to have a 10 minute water cooler conversation just so people meet each other. Uh, but this is still a challenge that we have uh, in our company. So finally, the conclusions uh, for us, uh, that structured first month in, in which we had really had a big uh, a structured program written out for them, really helped them connect with the company and with their colleagues. Uh, they were not lost. They knew where to go. They knew they could always ask us. It really promoted uh, those, that interaction that you're looking for uh, uh, when you're working remotely. And we also learned that social interactions don't happen spontaneously. You really have to create those opportunities. Uh, you have to have a lot of meetings. You have to uh, encourage them to, to just contact you, call you, uh, have a spontaneous pair programming session uh, because it just doesn't happen when everyone's working at home. And this is something that you really need to invest time into. Uh, we've also learned some lessons. Be mindful of working hours. Um, it's really easy to go over or to plan too much in a week. And another lesson that we've learned is to be mindful of breaks and group sessions because they're really taxing. So you have to... Uh, I keep that in mind. Well, and this is uh, basically uh, how we tackled the issue of uh, coaching junior developers. Our junior developers are really happy with it. Um, are there any questions about it? Awesome, thank you. We have time for maybe one question. There were some good yes, um, agreements in chat as far as like VS Code and Live Share and a few other things being good for pair programming. Uh, if there's any questions, go ahead and put them in chat.
Uh, sorry for going over. It's okay. <laughs> We're not too horribly off, I think. All righty. Let's go ahead and do nice uh, show of applause in the chat here. And uh, Fernando, are you ready to? Yes, I'm ready. Awesome. Let's go ahead and have you uh, screen share and take it away. Thanks for having me. I am Fernando Massandori. I am a Japanese guy with blue glasses. I'm wearing a gray shirt because I have two cats, one black cat, the other is white. <laughs> I am professor at Sao Paulo State University in Brazil. And in the first slides, you will see the URL for the slides. Uh, there are mainly two audiences, my university students and Python Brazilian community. Uh, it's emergency. It's not a traditional online course. It's a COVID-19 response. And mainly to keeping education alive um, for more, more than one year, <laughs> just now. No? Um, 75% of my students are low income. So it's important to keep uh, education life for these students. And the main results, 90% of my students complete the course. It's awesome. And for Brazilian Python community, my material have 20,000 new subscribers, 4 million views and 1.5 million downloads and in one, one year, uh, last year's statistics. And it's awesome, more than 20% of uh, YouTube channel assistants is women. And is a result of a partner partnership with um, PyLadies chapters in Brazil. We are promoting my course. <laughs> Uh, some experiences. Uh, blind presentation at the beginning of the classes. I describe myself and describe my environment to the students. And there are a lot of challenges. We, we the teachers became a multitasking. <laughs> um, but the more digital the teaching environment which is, the more human we need to be. And so it's okay to be vulnerable. I use flipped classrooms. We, we've pre-recorded pre the YouTube uh, content videos and synchronous moments with Discord mainly uh, for communication. And um, my experience is better that have short videos, four minutes videos, and the synchronous interactions with small time, not more than half an hour. Some students need to have uh, alternative text to materials, not only videos, and audios. Uh, we are, I buy uh, I buy a good microphone, a blue yet, to uh, my virtual classes. And some students use uh, smartphones, cell phones to uh, listen and see the the classes. So I need to use big fonts in the codes. Lots of alternative communication channels, mainly Discord, sometimes WhatsApp and uh, Slack. My exams uh, is a very different. <laughs> 
because the, the, the students have a um, um, lot of mental health problems. In, and so the Myzant is, is a, a little more analytic to fix uh, main concepts. Um, I implemented a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring between the students. It's okay, it's a very good experience. And I have a art psychology, repeat the same in several different ways, like Coca-Cola <laughs> advertising. <laughs> um, the classes is problem-based oriented. The problem is first. And we put some fun in classes. Uh, you see some code, and <laughs> the result is uh, 42, because is the, the answer. I have changed, changed the randout.py library. It's a good way to show how uh, good it is to use free software uh, in practice. And, um, some concepts is very hard to, to teach, like object, object oriented inheritance, but using some tricks, it's, uh, we have a lot of fun. And even advanced concepts like, like metaprogramming and um, AST parsing. And the function is resposta is the same as answer in English. And the print hello mundo is hello world. <laughs> and conclusion, my presentation is very short. Uh, like my videos, I record the interactions with the students whenever possible. I change the exams to consolidate learning, not as assessment, and 90% of my students successfully complete the course. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions and things now. If anyone wants to put them in the chat, remember I'll read them out. So please go ahead and queue them up. There was some side discussion about um, the microphone recommendations. Um, yeah, so people were asking for the link to the um, the slides. If you could oh, okay. As bit dot she. Oh, so some uh, one one minute. I will. But yeah, if you just want to copy and paste it in there. Yes, I copy awesome. and paste. Yeah. One, uh, one minute only. Ready. Perfect. All right, we have a question coming in of how did you implement peer-to-peer -peer mentoring? Oh, with mainly with VS Code, it's good to, to uh, connect with one student. VS Code. Okay. Uh, another question in is, um, do you know anything about the students who didn't complete the course and why they may not have finished? Oh, Brazilian have a lot of internet connection problems. And some students even doesn't have a computer. I, I need to call to these students to give um, particular lessons, which is very hard. Uh, reality in Brazil, there are a lot of uh, inequalities. OK. Another question of, uh, was it difficult to manipulate your courseware such that the topics were short? I'm um, presuming this is, yeah, <laughs> similar to, to the next question as well. <laughs> How'd you get to that four minutes? <laughs> I'm good about uh, hitting like 15 to 20 minute chunks, but four uh, minutes. Using list comprehension. <laughs> 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 no, it's a joke. Uh, if you um, record the, the main concepts, it's really, um possible to change to four minutes videos 
Awesome. Um, if you have any public examples, I think um, a lot of us, including myself, would be interested in seeing a few examples if you wanted to put them in chat or um, send them off to the Python uh, education um, mailing oh, okay. list or something. It's like uh, I, will sh I will share uh, again and one, one second. I mean, you still technically have five minutes left in your talk if you just want to show one. <laughs> okay. Or maybe just give us a sample. Uh, oh, it, this is the slides. One second. It's the, it's the end. For example, and if you need to teach um, uh, object-oriented concepts like uh, inheritance, yeah, I define a class in T42 <laughs> and overload the Dunder add and Dunder str to result 42. <laughs> and the right side, I I have two instances uh, in T42, uh, the two numbers, but the A plus B is 42, and uh, the print A is 42, the print B is 42. It's a straightforward way uh, possible to put in four minutes video to uh, teach one concept. Okay, interesting. All right, there's another question. Um to the group, oh, that admit button's not working there. Um, did everyone else know about the Python hand gesture, like an S with the thumb? Huh. Ah, yes. So uh, is, that, is that something it's, circa it's, just your, just the Brazilian group? Yes, Brazilian group, uh, okay, some, some one minute. Uh, the Brazilian group have uh, very care to diversity and the design is to blind people, to, uh, to deaf people to know how Python is. Python is to, to uh, uh, the, the so Brazilian snake, sign language. Snake, 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 snake sign language. Awesome. I love it. I didn't even notice that about this picture when you were going through. Perfect. All right. We have time for maybe one more question, um, and then we'll get back on track with the next talk. <laughs> it's very cool. It's really cool. I have to practice it to get it like the right direction. <laughs> I would do the wrong. All righty. Let's give them. Um, oh, um, there's a question of how you can you sponsor a student? If, how can um, we sponsor a student? Uh, uh, I don't understand the question. Probably like financially sponsor students ah, okay, um, who okay. need help with getting a computer. Yes, thing. yes. Um, the professors of my new students uh, sponsoring some um, low income and to buy a uh, refurbished computers, and the government gave them uh, some ships with a lot of gigabytes of internet connection. Okay, cool. All right, so let's do a big um, chat round of applause for Fernando, and we're gonna go ahead and flip over Thanks. to Thanks Samana. Thanks for having me. Samana. All right, Samana, um, you wanna go ahead and take over and um, get started on your talk. Hi, everybody. I'm Sumana Hariharishwara. Um, I've just shared some contact information for myself in the chat. Uh, and I'm talking today about tools that we need in order to help teach project management. Um, I'm not going to be using slides. You could let your eyes wander and rest for the next 15 minutes if you want. Um, if you wanna get up and uh, fold laundry or, or do something else, if you have uh, remote headphones, then you know that, that is fine. Just like close your eyes if you want. Um, I know that how long, it, you know, when you're watching PyCon stuff all day and all week, it can be tough on the eyes. <clears throat> I am going to be drawing a lot from a blog post that I wrote about uh, this, this question problem. So, and that has a lot of links in case uh, you want to look at those. 
My question is, how can we teach not only programming, but further professional open source skills, such as maintainer and project manager skills? Uh, right now, as far as I know, there's no set of exercises that helps instructors teach skills like assessing an open source software project systematically, uh, triaging bugs, noticing quiet but promising contributors to promote and improving code review processes. So today I'm going to share a vision for a toolkit that could aid us in instructing future open source maintainers and also talk a little bit about why I think, you know, the kinds of skills that I want us to be able to help people learn. Uh, I'm writing a book on maintaining legacy open source software projects um, and I want people to be able to learn this stuff, right? Because part of open source sustainability is not just helping uh, existing software maintainers grow their skills, but helping teach new people those skills. Um, that right now, uh, as far as I know, there's uh, no textbook or course you can work through to learn these skills. Assessing an open source project systematically, uh, improving code review processes, writing a grant proposal, finding your successors, um, or there are courses and guides that cover different software leadership areas, but there's nothing that covers the whole toolbox. When I'm teaching these skills, I want to give learners exercises that they can use uh, to develop and practice those skills. And if I turn this book into a course, I want to be able to assign those exercises and review their homework. Uh, so I started thinking how nice it would be if I could snapshot or composite together a sample legacy open source software project complete with messy old issues, documentation, chat and mailing list archives, and then replicate that in self-serve sandboxes for exercises. Um, I, want, I want to talk a little bit about what I want learners to be able to do. And then let's talk about, therefore, what, what tool would need to exist so that people can have these hands-on exercises. As a trainer, I would instruct learners in how to answer various questions as they progress through three basic levels of open source software engagement, newcomer, contributor, and maintainer. All of this is assuming that the most important things we're trying to teach people are not so much uh, software issues like how to write functions and classes, how to write and review code, but uh, the goal is that this person is trying to become a co-leader of the project um, maintainers have a lot of work to do outside of being lead developers, including uh, the equivalent of customer support, right? User support, creating roadmaps and uh, doing release management, writing technical, uh, doing te technical writing of, of manuals, emails, good bug reports, uh, release announcements, um, managing interpersonal issues, and, and, and so on and so on. So, the first time newcomer has certain learning goals. Once people have a certain level of skill, they can move on to being treated as a contributor, being treated as a manager, as a maintainer, right? So some questions that I want learners to be able to answer. A first time newcomer, I want them to be able to look at the existing artifacts, the existing material of an open source software project. This is issues, documentation, chat archives, mailing list archives, all this communication, and be able to find out what is the goal? What is the goal of this project? Who is involved? Who's active? Who seems to be in charge? Who's getting in the way? What are the doomed things? What are the controversial things around here, right? Uh, in the US, we would call something a third rail because it's like uh, certain electrified train systems. There's two rails that the thing goes along, the car goes along, and then there's a third rail that's electrified. And if you touch it, you're gonna be in real trouble. So what are the third rails around here? And uh, if I bring something up, if, I, uh, if a thing needs doing, will it be controversial? Who are you gonna have to keep an eye out for? Maybe they're not a particularly difficult person in general, but the kinds of things that you are likely to need to do, they might find uh, difficult to deal with, they might be threatened by that. What is the backlog? What is the undone work? What kind of work is it? How much is there? How fast does this project usually go? How long do individual chunks of work take? 
what is getting stuck. As a contributor, uh, some things that a, learner's a learner might need to be able to understand based on pre-existing information. What should I concentrate on? What should I concentrate on doing? What backlogged work is something that I should do? And what is work that ought to be delegated to someone else? Uh, what should my timelines and goals be for how fast I should do things so as not to be a bottleneck? This work that I'm working on right now, email, a, doc, a piece of documentation, a wiki page, is it ready to go? Is it ready to submit for peer review? What tag or label is appropriate for this issue or this patch, this pull request? What is the actual process for becoming a committer here? You know, there might be something in the documentation about, well, you have to do this and this and this, and then you ask for uh, permissions, but is that really true? Or uh, is there some unwritten process? And finally, a question that I would like a maintainer to be able to, or questions that I would like maintainers to be able to answer based on being able to look at all of this uh, conversational material. Is this work, this uh, particular chunk of work, let's say uh, uh, an email someone wants to send out as an announcement of a new release uh, or a piece of documentation or uh, some improvement to the, the website, is this publishable? Is it releasable? If not, what improvement does it need in order to be publishable? Uh, look at a past project failure or trouble spot. What went wrong and what should the team do better next time? What is the real organization chart here? If you want to get people to agree to some new initiative, some change, whom do you need to persuade? Is there anyone here who ought to be promoted, right? Existing contributors who ought to be handed the power to be co-maintainers. Is there anyone here who needs to be kicked out? Uh, someone who needs to be fired. And just as the first time newcomer asked, what is the existing goal? What are our existing priorities? A maintainer should be able to answer, what should our priorities and roadmap be? These are some questions that I would like people to be able to answer. So I've been thinking about this for a while. Uh, and uh, in March, I, I wrote up a specification uh, for some tooling that I would like to have exist. I don't know what to call it, maintainer sandbox, snow globe factory diorama. And this assumes that a trainer is leading a cohort of learners through a semi-synchronous online course. And this would work well for an in-person class as well. I would, one would have to adapt it for a completely self-paced and self-driven course. So as instructor, I would create a snapshot of a sample open source project comprising certain materials that I'll go into. And the hosting platform would replicate it in self-serve instances usable over the web for user exercises. And upon signing up for a course, a user would get access to a freshly provisioned instance complete with project history. So each instance would include the following artifacts, all browsable and searchable via the web browser, bug tracker type artifacts, project documentation and overview information, archives of mailing lists and archives of chat. Let me talk about those a little bit more. So the bug tracker, right? This is something you would generally see as part of a GitLab or GitHub project, uh, that there is a Git repository for code history. There's past and present issues and patches, pull requests, merge requests. And these are com complete with tags, labels, milestones, signees, similar metadata, past conversation, uh, past release announcements. If there's a wiki, this would be part of this. Project documentation and overview information for users and for developers, in some cases, a wiki might be part of this. Um, this would also be the stuff that's generally available on a project's website or a read the docs instance. Uh, and even if documentation source is available in the Git repository, in the learner's materials, this snapshot we provide should include the docs as rendered into HTML. Archives of the project's mailing list. So this would generally be available in a mailman or major domo or similar instance. And we would want to, again, browsable and searchable via a web interface. And archives of the project's chat conversations, uh, like for instance, a browsable history of internet relay chat or a public Zulip chat history or something like that. So uh, I have some links in this blog post about how to do some portion of this using GitLab.
um, and the Percival project might be a good tool to consider for mailing lists and chat archives, but there's no tool that can do this all in one. Let's talk about access privileges for a second. The learner would not only interact with the example project materials as a reader, but also as a participant, learning through uh, moving through these three access levels, right, newcomer, contributor, maintainer, and the instructor would be able to view a learner's instance with administrator access. So the uh, instructor can assess the learner's actions. So at level one, newcomer, this learner starts with the same user privileges that a new user would ordinarily have. They can read all the public mailing lists, all the chat histories, all the wiki and bug tracker items. They can file bugs. Level two, right, a contributor, so the instructor can promote the learner to the second access level. And at that point, the learner can triage, label and close bugs and pull requests and patches and edit the wiki and post to public mailing lists. And finally, the instructor can promote the learner to this third administrative access level. And at that point, the learner can, for instance, browse and post to private mailing lists and chat channels. So for instance, if there's a security list or a maintainers only mailing list or chat channel, they get to see that now. And they get to use maintainer powers on the Git repository, such as merging pull requests and patches. So I imagine that dealing with authentication in this application could kind of get sticky. My preferred approach is that uh, a signed in platform user automatically is logged into all these different web apps. It's not possible to view an instance unless you're either the learner or the instructor associated with that instance. Ideally, it would also be possible for an instructor to expand access for group projects so that uh, learner A can have access to learner B's project instance. But um, that would be great for peer learning and group exercises, but I think that would lead to a lot question, you know, code of conduct problems, interactions between learners and stuff like that. So at least in what I want as a trainer in the earliest version of this tool, I'm happy with not having that and just saying, all right, if you want to have a pair or a small group do stuff, use screen sharing. And finally, you know, we got to think about end of life for all this stuff. So let's say at the end of a course, each instance turns read only for a couple of weeks to allow the learner to make notes and make local copies of any work they've done. And then this platform would delete this instance. So I have two main questions for you all. One, if you know of software that already does like at least half of what I've defined here, please let me know. I am trying to work on providing training so that people can learn these maintainership skills. And I would rather not have to you know, build this. Um, second, when you think about what it takes for people to train up to be project managers and software maintainers, what are skills that you think that they need to be able to learn? And, and maybe what are aspects of this kind of tool that you think would be necessary in order for people to be able to play with and learn these things in a sandbox, right? In a safe environment before they move on to um, working on a, a real project that affects other people. So with that, uh, I'm open to questions. All right, thank you. Okay. so. Um, it might be helpful if you want to put in chat, just really quickly uh, Elizabeth, type I'm not up. sure what you mean by the not questions questions. Oh, no, I was going to say, when you, uh, you were asking for suggestion on, of if you have, it, your first thing was, um, if you knew, know of any resource that does the, that does the thing you want, <laughs> because my example of the please ask questions that are actually questions was like, don't just ask a question to tell someone about something. Well, now's the chance if you really want to. Oh, I'm to. so sorry. I misunderstood. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'm also, I'm also open to more, I'm open to other questions as well. I just wanted yeah. to prompt people in case yeah. people didn't have any questions, but they had suggestions. I'm also open to questions. Sorry. Yeah. So please go ahead. And if you have any questions, um, uh, scoot them in the chat there and I'll read them out. It's nice to have a little bit of a slide break. I figured, yeah. Yeah, I don't know of anything in particular other than like community organization sometimes, but it's still like actually impacting other people. I have a link dump of maintainer resources, says Daniel. Well, Daniel, we expect a blog post with those links. Um, yeah, awesome. And thank you for all of your like other links as well that you've put in the chat. Sure, yeah. So um, I'm working on a book on uh, how to get open source projects unstuck 
so I have a free sampler of some draft chapters of that available that people can get by subscribing to my email list. So that's the link that says a sampler offer in there. Um, and I would really love for, uh, if there's other people here as part of the summit, right, who are trainers, um, I'd also love to know, hey, also, if you think that this just can't work, I want to know that. If you're like, no, Samana, actually, I tried, and or, mm. or I saw someone who tried, and it's just not possible to give people training that includes hands-on exercises that is in any way a good, meaningful proxy or, or meaningfully related to the things they will need to do as real project managers, I want to know that. Interesting. I do have kind of a question. Um, it's more of like, want to hear your thoughts on it. So one of my research areas is um, sort of information processes in open source development and how is information, you know, passed along. And I'm actually doing, it's really similar to like quilting and sewing because it's very procedural and highly technical. And uh Y'all know that like quilters have been doing this for 150 years plus, so they're kind of better at it than we are. So that's what's really interesting. Anyhow, one of the things, especially working in data science, I get the like Python versus R conversation all the time. And especially when it comes to, it's, you know, usually like, eh, whatever, until you get to visualization. And visualization, it's like, oh God, everything's kind of rough. But the R community went through this like visualization diaspora long, like a couple years ago, like five, seven years ago, there were a ton of visualization packages and then they slowly kind of died off and ggplot was left. And now the community is like, it's just ggplot, it's fine. And in Python, we're still, we've got a huge amount of support for a lot of different visualization. Maybe I'm totally wrong. I totally I'm open to like, as you said, Elizabeth, this is not how it works. Um, but my impression has always been that in Python, it went through that natural kind of diaspora thing where there were many, many visualization packages, except a lot of them were backed by like venture capital or other sort of big fundraising things. And so they've had cash to keep the, pro to keep the project alive. And thus we haven't seen the sort of natural trimming that you would, that we at least saw in R. And so the whole ecosystem is still like pretty broad. So my question to you is, what do you think about, you talk about trying to unstuck a, an open source project. And clearly if you think like, I'm gonna work really hard to get this thing unstuck, like it, it certainly has to have value if that's true. But how do you make the call of just like, today's the day we, the day we let it die? That's a really good question. So when I think about what are the things that a project could, you know, what are the, the different ways that it gets stuck and what are, what are the premises to use when we think about this? One of the premises that I have is that every project, every institution has a life cycle, mm -hmm. right? And it is possible for any given project that I'm working on, if I'm running into a problem, maybe the underlying cause of that problem is we should not be pushing forward on this anymore. People should be switching their effort to other things. Um, I actually gave a talk at a conference uh, or not at a conference as part of the GitHub office of the CTO speaker series recently mm -hmm. um, called what would it look like if open source were healthy? And one of the things that I suggested was a healthy open source project would have better end of life processes for us, like the people who care about a project collectively being able to make the decision, you know what, we should wind this down. And then uh, having some, some processes for helping people migrate onto you know, competing platforms if, if that's what was necessary. Um, some of the things that projects get stuck in, there's a strategy question, right? Like why does this project exist? And based on that, what should we prioritize? And sometimes no one has really asked, what is our goal? Is our project, is this project serving this goal better than other competing projects, right? What, what do our users need? And so I would say that um, it, there's, there's certainly a combination of factors, but 
if you ask yourself, what is the reason this project exists? What is it? What capability are we giving users? How are we liberating users from drudgery or giving them some new ability compared to all the other options that they have? And then if you kind of don't have an answer to that, because it, practically everything that you're doing is reasonably well or will probably very soon be reasonably taken care of by other uh, competing projects, then I think, yeah, it, it does behoove a person to say, to ask, well, well, then why are you doing this? I think there's absolutely room in the world for a zillion hobby projects, right? Like one of the most common things people do when they're learning Python is let's say write their own CMS, write their own uh, blog blogging engine or something like that. That's fine. It's a, like the point now, the reason you're doing it, what is the reason the project exists? I'm having fun. I'm learning. I'm learning how to do test-driven development. I'm trying out Pyramid. Sure. Okay, great. Once other people start depending on stuff, maybe your your trust changes. And then once fewer and fewer people either depend on you or you can see how those people would be very easily served by something else, even if you still want to work on it, this is maybe your chance to switch what your priority is. You're like, all right, if you really cared about reliability, now's your chance to switch over to our competitor. I I'm going to be doing some weird, interesting stuff now because I'm going to learn and I'm going to take this. Initiative. You know, there's a, there's different ways things can go, but I think it all has to start with a real reckoning of why does this project exist? Awesome. Thank you for those thoughts. Thanks. All right. And Daniel put some links in the chat as well for different things as well. So maybe you can kind of collect those up and add them to your blog post as well. All right. Let's give a big uh, chat round of applause. And we are now done with the full talks. We have two lightning talks coming up here. Um, so I think, pr I promise you, we'll be done in about 15 minutes if you're able to stay a little bit later. Um, OK, uh, Mickey, uh, are you able to? Uh... Yes. Awesome. Yes. All right, so I will leave it to you. I'll set a five minute timer. So please watch the chat. All right. I will make it even less than five minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, I want to talk about distilling your examples. Um, so I'm Miki Tebeka. I've been working with Python for 25 years, I think, and teaching for around 10. Um, small companies, big companies uh, all around the world. And I want to talk about uh, distilling. Uh, distilling is the act of making something uh, more pure or more condensed, or uh, you can call it. Usually, uh, we talked about it in uh, in drinks, but uh, it's not only for that. So, uh, what what prompted this uh, uh, talk is that um, we, we're doing a lot of teaching in uh, online phases, and I'm found out that you know it's really hard to judge if people are watching you or not, if they're paying attention or not. So I had uh, I went and looked and found out if there are any research about uh, student attention during class. And there are several ones. And the idea is that students' attention is, um, is like flickering. Uh, they have uh, phases of attention, and then they're not paying attention. And then back and forth, every phase is, is a couple of minutes, maybe three, four minutes. And it starts really early in the class, around uh, two and a half minutes in the class. Uh, this is the first time that they usually start to phase out from class, which prompted me to think about when they're coming back from these uh, phases of not paying attention, wh what are they seeing? And is it clear enough so they can get back to it without um, a need for me to explain them what's going on? Uh, so I'll give an example. I was teaching a class about serialization. Uh, taking uh, data uh, data structure in the language in Python and converting it to a sequence of bytes. Uh, here's an example of a serialization in, of, of text. But uh, the example I gave was this one. So I said, okay, let's, let's assume that we have a trading platform and we have a trade which has a symbol, a volume, a price, and, and a buy flip. And I started getting questions from students. And the questions are, uh, What's a data class? Because we're not familiar with that. Uh, uh, is this a decorator, this thing with the, the at sign? Um, is this a valid syntax with a colon and then the stir? 
Oh, do we really have types in Python? And where's the dunder in it of this class? I'm missing something. And the discussion went from talking about just showing an example and going um, to a trade. It's about data classes. So I said, you know what? And next time I'm going to do a trade, which is a normal class. Like they already know. So they know about class, they know about init. Uh, there's no types. So hopefully it's easier for them to understand. And then I said, you know, they're going to copy it out. And when they copy it out, there are four fields here. And for my purpose of explanation, I can do with two. So let's do a go with quantity, which has only a value and a unit. And then I can do a height with quantity and, uh, and a unit. And then I thought a little bit more and I said, you know what? Why do I need a class? I can just do a dictionary with the height and unit, and I can still focus on serialization, on talking about the stuff that I want to talk about, and not on everything outside. Uh, and this is um, a process I'm doing with all my examples. I'm like, how can I get rid of anything that is not relevant to what I'm teaching? And usually I find out that I start with something which is too elaborate, and then I trim it down, trim it down, trim it down, until I distill it to the essence of what I'm trying to teach. Same goes for the ID when I'm teaching. So this is an example from Visual Studio Code, but that's not the only thing. And when people look at that, when I'm writing uh, stuff down, uh, this is um, just, uh, oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, so this is, um, you know, uh, the pop-ups, the, the, the bars, um, everything, it's too much. So I'm going out usually with a simpler editor, which focuses only on the code. I think that um, line numbers are important. They give you focus about talking to, um, they can reference uh, lines that they have questions, but not much more than that. And even here, you know, people are asking, what are these squiggly lines? What is the all thing meaning? What is insert, et cetera, et cetera. So I haven't found an editor yet that is really bare bones and just for teaching. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. And I hope you, you will start going through your examples and make them uh, this, uh, more condensed and clear. Awesome, thank you. You The timer just went off, so right at five minutes. Um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, there was a note in the chat that it reminds about um, Linda Stone's continuous partial attention observation. And yeah, line numbers are super <laughs> interesting. I use PyCharm Education Edition for this reason, because it just doesn't talk as much to students. And there's still a few things to get through, but there's just, there's like the code and then there's like the big green button to run code. And yeah. like, that's all there is to worry about. So but yeah, it's always nice to know about other things too. All right, any questions? I think we have time for like one or two questions. Okay, um, we're gonna go switch up to today. Um, I'm probably getting your name right. If you wanna give me a correction, I'll <laughs> try it again. It sounded um, pretty good. Yeah, I think uh, I heard Todd A's, so that sounded pretty good. Awesome, cool. Go ahead and take it over and I'll set um, five minute timer for you. All right, uh, go ahead. Oh, I need to make you a co-host here. There you go. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Go. Uh, hope you can share uh, see what i'm showing on the powerpoint yep looks good awesome hey thanks everyone for joining me today uh it's been a great uh event so far this is my talk computational thinking for creatives decoding barriers to entry i am Tade hikopian i am a design technologist and developer with a background in architecture that's uh building architecture the kind of engineering design and i've been uh, over the years uh experimenting with different ways to use code to help design the building you inhabit. And also that includes training, uh, open source content, all that stuff. And Python is one of my favorite things. So I'm glad to be here talking to you all. And one of the big things today is to talk about how we can uh, remove barriers to entry for people who need to learn how to code or use some kind of programmatic uh, solution and uh, make it more convenient. In our case, in my company, HMC Architects, where I work, we're trying to get the average designer to be more comfortable with programmatic uh, coding. Uh, of one kind or the other. And we wanna make them feel comfortable and feel like they're in their own shoes, uh, in their own skin when they do this, uh, so that we don't hire 20 different programmers to do this kind of work because that could 
be one solution, but that's not cost effective. Cost effective. So how do we get people who are more familiar with sketching, like this fellow right here, uh, and drawing stuff, which is a very you know touchy feeling, and get comfortable something they're not used to? Uh, and we have to explain to people, one way to get this started is to explain to people what computational thinking is, not computers, not programming, the thinking process, so they can apply it to just about everything they do to kind of reorient themselves to problem solving. So you have to consider your audience to understand how this uh, can be implemented. In our case, uh, it's creative types, people who like colors and depth and dimensions and you know, what are they comfortable with? Well, what they're not comfortable with is a bunch of text coders and IDEs. It's too abstract. It looks too intimidating. They're like, I can't do this. And, and these are like people with like master's degrees in like building science and all that kind of stuff. So they're like, whoa, what's this? So how do you bridge that gap? Well, you match like with like. Uh, there's architecture patterns, there's computer patterns and the design patterns. I'm sure many of you have heard this kind of language before. So I fall back on the common ground that we have is that, you know, the, the thinking is the same. So how can I use that thinking to my advantage to help people learn and remove those barriers and not like assume they're going to need to know how to use text coding right away? So we're talking about computational thinking to uh, as a thought process to express solutions and sets as an algorithm, but that could be just a, a way to solve any problems that the computer but can be carried out by a computer. So that usually means uh, using abstractions, organizing the data, breaking the problem down to smaller parts, using uh, iteration and symbol representation to that define the problem, formulate the problem, uh, analyze solutions, and then create a general problem solving guide. So in short, that's what computational thinking is, and that's what we applied. Uh, with the basic breakdown being inputs and outputs, what you put in is going to get you a uh, result, just like you would in coding, uh, data flow, data types, and recursion to improve your code. So this is the baseline of what we did to get these kind of results, which is what architects want to do, is to make cool buildings that are uh, technically complex, but also resolve the design challenges. They like visuals. They like seeing things. They, they like how they can look at something and study it very uh, sophisticated. So how can we do this visually, the whole computational thinking process? We just use a uh, visual scripting, low code. And it's as simple as putting it, in this case, it's food, uh, but we'll get into like a little more actual solution in a second here. It's an input uh, that you can, you know, the ingredients, I, I want the results of cakes. I have oven, I have I have uh, ingredients and I, and I have to put them together. So you can show how you can break that down the steps of different inputs, a process to put them together and combine them at the end for your result. That's This is the high level thinking we have for them. And then we translate that into different low code solutions. Uh, one is called Grasshopper, it's a visual scripting solution. And this is literally how you make a cup, cup of coffee in Grasshopper. So they can get a sense of like, oh, this is computational thinking. What are the steps, break it down, uh, process and combine things to get a result. And, one, and then we translate that directly into the software we're using to model things. And I have coordinates of the building outline and the building walls on the left here. I then take them through a process of translating geometry and I get an output of floors and walls, which gives me this cool thing, a hundred story tall skyscraper. That's a very simplistic building that gets results. Like, oh, okay, this is how you get coordinates. They can see what they're putting in as an input, translate to geometry and get an output. And it's very touchy-feely, designers and creative types and a lot of people actually, uh, children, they like touchy-feeling things. They like to touch things to see the results. So these kind of low code solutions with this input output process can really encourage them to explore and try things out and get cool results like this. The same process that we saw before is like inputs, outputs, computational thinking, give them something familiar, give them something visual and at high level. They can work with, create some interesting geometry that they can play with. They're not seeing like numbers, they're seeing actual geometry. And then you can give them something that's very uh, familiar to them, a slider to change the results after they went through all these computational things. So instead of trying to force them into a box of like learn to code and go through all this rigor and moral, it's like, why don't we meet in the middle? You're gonna learn enough to do computational thinking, use a tool that you, you'll be easy enough to dive into and to get the results you're familiar with. In this case, a 3D model, you can modify it. And that gets them excited. And of course, my favorite thing, Python, we can use Python to help do recursion of combining an entire script area in the programming visual script into just textual script. That's the next level here. But you're not, they're not gonna learn that until they do computational thinking, the visual scripting and all that. So that's the next level, but you, they're not gonna really start with this level. They're gonna be completely lost. So we do have to move those barriers to entry. And eventually we'll get things to, the growth here is to do uh, computational design, general design to expand the ways they can uh, create forms, have different kinds of visual audio, text and you know touch learning depending on what we have as assets and then create cool things like this 
This is an actual building we designed in Chabot that's in the Bay Area uh, that uses energy analysis to create all the louvers that gets optimized louver penetration based on so solar paths. And of course, we did use the visual scripting tools to make this possible with lots of inputs and outputs. This is more sophisticated, but the same thing as a computational, computational thinking workflow. And we got some cool things like how we can model this, make an optimized solution and create panels that somebody can actually install and build. So this is actually being applied by our staff on these great projects, but it does take a village to support the average user. We have, I have a great uh, staff to work with at HMC Architects and we're making this all possible. So don't try to, I would say if you have people to work with anybody, work with them, find people. This is a whole team we have for a, a company of 300 people. So we do try to leverage our resources, but to also be sympathetic and see where our people are so we can meet them. And so key concepts, um, start with a concept of computational design or computational thinking to create a training style compatible with how your staff thinks if you're trying to you know, get a broader audience into coding and create that baseline thinking, create resources and training systems that are compatible with how they think and what they're used to, reduce the anxiety, make it an easy start, create a structured course, try things out, review, upgrade, and continue forever because it'll never end. But that's also half the fun. I have some links here in the resources. I think I can distribute this deck. And uh, thanks, everybody. I got my contact information there. Uh, any questions? But it was a pleasure talking to all of you today in this lightning talk. Awesome. Thank you. There is a question here in chat. Uh, what tools are you using for visual scripting? Excellent question. Let's go back to the visual scripting. Um, this is Grasshopper. If you guys look up in Google Rhino Grasshopper, just like the, you know, the name of the um, bug, you'll find this. This is a very popular use for just this kind of thing. Like this is exactly Grasshopper. It's very fluid. Um, it's open source Grasshopper. Rhino does have a cost with its educational version. And the other one you saw here, this is Dynamo with Revit from Autodesk. Dynamo is also open source. Revit is a popular build, building information modeling software that we use at both Rhino and Revit are popular in the design uh, uh, architecture design community. They both have visual scripting. They both can do these kind of cool things where you can see the results. This is from Dynamo with Reddit. And there's also another one for all of you I didn't include in this presentation called PyFlow, which is like this, but Python based visual scripting, just like, you know, if you might have, some of you might have heard Node Reddit. So these are the two I've been using. Blender also has something like this, I believe. So, but the ones that we've been using for training is Dynamo and Grasshopper because those are the ones we've been training as a baseline. We have a baseline Revit shop and we have a baseline Rhino shop. So we, these great visual scripting tools that are open source with Python support built in is what we've been using for this kind of thing. And you guys can at least try to uh, check out a trial version or at least look at these up if you're more interested. But I also have links in this presentation I'll send out to people. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions you want to throw them in chat? I have seen the Blender thing. It was a lot but I was also not invested to learn it very well. So. well. And this is Blender. So guys, if you want something completely free, check out Blender. This is totally free, has a ton of Python support and all sorts of other support. Highly recommend if you just want to screw around. This is great stuff. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Thank you so much. And that is going to be it for the Trainer Summit. So uh, thank you all so much. Oh, yeah. Big chat, or chat applause for today. Um, Thank you all so much for attending. Thank you to our speakers as well for coming in. Um, and yeah, this has been awesome. I'm hoping to do this again as well uh, next year. We'll see if it'll be in person. We will see what we can do about making things virtual as well. Um, I have been very happy to <laughs> see at least some familiar names and some new names in this space. So that's really all I have for you all today. Um, there's a couple, if you're willing to stick around, there's a couple of links I can throw in. There's a Python education Slack group that I have that I've run if you wanna join in. It's relatively low traffic, but um, I can grab that link and inv for inviting people. Um, yeah, we'll see what this format will be next year. Um, it, may, it was originally last year supposed to be a full day thing, next, and then it became a two hour Zoom thing, and then this year also a two hour Zoom thing. So we'll see for next Elizabeth, year, but watch out. Elizabeth, I just wanna take this second to thank you for organizing this. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, everybody had 
uh, a difficult time with 2020 and 2021. And in, in spite of all that, you know, you put this together and I'm, I'm just re really grateful and appreciative for it. I think this was the first year that we had a summit that was really, where there was a day really devoted just to training, mm -hmm. right? And so- The first uh, one was last was, year. Oh, okay, um, the first one was last year, right. Yeah. Uh, sorry, but this was my first time participating in the one that mm -hmm. was just about, particularly about training. So thank you very much. And thank you. I want to give a clap to Elizabeth. For Same here. Yeah, I'm glad thank it Elizabeth. was part of the Python. Um, last year was part of the Python incubator that I proposed it. And so, um, and when I was talking to Jackie about doing the education summit again, she was like, oh, if you want to do trainers again, we can do that. And so um, I really appreciate that we have this dedicated space because the needs are really really specific to training and so i'm glad we have um think yeah let me get that slack link you all are um welcome to make sure it's the right slack channel i'm not inviting you to the back channel slacks but oh that was to dm on accident here you go all right thank you all so much this has been recorded so you'll be able to grab those links and things on youtube when they get it uploaded um have a great weekend Enjoy the rest of PyCon itself starting tomorrow. So go <laughs> recharge your Zoom batteries for the weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. I'll stick around until most people are gone. All right, I'm going to bail. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Bye. Bye.